Today is Good Friday, or perhaps we should say it is God's Friday. God's Friday because today a battle is entered into and sin is defeated. God's Friday because God offers God's self to us fully this day. God's Friday because today is the gateway to Easter. And let us all pray. Gracious God, look on us with mercy, for we are among the ones who betrayed Jesus and saw him given over into the hands of sinners and saw him suffer and die on the cross. Show us how to love as we have been loved on this Good Friday. And hear us now as we pray that prayer our Lord has taught us and we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 216, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Hymn 216, let us stand and sing. Please be seated. We know well the statement from the cross that Jesus made, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What we may not know is that that comes from the 22nd Psalm, a psalm which does begin in humility but ends with great celebration about the power of God, God's power to save. 
Listen then to the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. All who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him deliver. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. My hands and feet have shriveled. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May their hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him, for dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. To him, indeed, all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people as yet unborn, saying, yes, he has done it. And this is the word of the Lord.
worship on Good Friday recalls six hours, six long hours from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon, the hours on which Jesus, in which Jesus hung on the cross, the hours that it took Jesus to die. The ancient Persians, a vast empire headquartered in what is modern day Iran, they were the first to use crucifixion and they did it to put the offenders above ground, to raise them up off the earth because the earth belonged to the gods and the Persians did not want the offenders fouling the earth and so they raised them up. And then the Romans doubled down on the practice and they made of it a great and public horror, a deterrent surely to anyone who was resisting their control. The Romans loved order, and they believed Jesus' large following, especially after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, that following constituted a threat to their political control. And the Jewish authorities also were complicit in Jesus' death. They believed the claims about Jesus, that he was the Son of God, that he had healed people, they had raised Lazarus. They believed that those were blasphemous claims. And so we begin reading this story. Matthew, the 27th chapter, and it's on page 32 in the back of the few Bibles if you wish to follow along. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. And let us pause for a moment and we'll remain seated as we sing together hymn 218, the first two verses of hymn 218. Ah, holy Jesus. Mercy and love are sometimes shown in restraint. Jesus is being shamed and bullied. 
But God somehow seems willing to wait, to wait until we exhaust ourselves, exhaust ourselves on the foolishness of our sin. Maybe when we have finished our foolishness, we will turn to God again. God's love makes God wonderfully hopeful for the best. When will we be at our best selves again? When will we be exhausted with the foolishness of our sin? We pick up the reading again at Matthew 27, 32. We'll see here that powerful people are abusing that power. Simon of Cyrene is an African from modern-day Libya, and he is being forced into service as if he were an employee of the state. He does what he's told to do, but it's still unjust. The matter of Jesus' crucifixion is already involving others as we are being involved. His death is public. We are all drawn into it. The last details of the crucifixion are being arranged. The cross itself is being prepared. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The compelling of Simon to carry the cross and the offer of a crude painkiller in the form of wine and gall are the beginnings of some slight pity, some small compassion for Jesus from the soldiers. Pity. Pity for God made man. We are, after all, none of us all bad. Neither are any of us all good. We pick up the reading again at verse 38. Two bandits were crucified with him, one on the right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Are you not the Son of God? Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. Why can't he save himself? He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and then we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in this same way. Well, the taunting of Jesus has now become religious, not political. Jesus comments about the temple, equating equating himself with it, and the messianic hunger for a king of Israel. All of that have brought this on. Chief priests, scribes, the elders of the people, and now bandits. Such a collaboration. At this point, it becomes desirable to us to look away, to refuse to see this terrible thing that's happening. The Scotsman and Christian leader George McLeod reminds us that Jesus wasn't crucified on a clean altar or a communion table between two beautiful candles. No, he was crucified on a trash heap called Golgotha outside the city walls of Jerusalem between two criminals where cynics talk smut and soldiers gamble. We want to look away, but to look away is to ignore what is happening What God has come to do, do not look away. The world is being changed. 
and let us remain seated and sing together the third, fourth, and fifth verses of hymn 218. Verse 45, from noon on darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, and about three o'clock Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. The wine that he had refused before, he now drinks. There is darkness. He dies. How far does Jesus' sense of forsakenness extend? Do we feel close to our Lord right now? Or is Jesus in his agony still just a distant, unfocused thought for us, someone from the past? Jesus' cry at the last are a mystery to those who watch him. Is he calling Elijah, they wonder? But then Matthew tells us there comes a great and triumphant cry. It is so powerful that all the Gospels remember this. At that moment, verse 51, at that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, 
They were terrified. And they said, truly, this man was God's son. Of course, no one but God in highest heaven could have torn the temple curtain from top to bottom. No one but the Lord of earth and air could make the rocks shake and split. No one but God, the life giver, could raise the saints from their tombs so that they could enter the holy city. Truly, this man was God's son. And we give thanks. Amen. We join together now in the hymn printed in our order of service. Let us. As we continue together to make a good Lent, we are together pointed toward Easter. Our Lord has come that we might be saved. Our Lord has come that our sins might be lifted as he himself was lifted on the cross. And so we go comforted, but we go challenged. Sin is real. Thank the Lord that Christ and his forgiveness is real grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, each one, now and forever.